obstacles, number of barriers, um, uh, the size of the barriers uh, for folks being act- physically active. Can you explain your disagreements with Athlean X for the, I mean, look, I've been uh, avoiding your question because it's annoying and who cares, right? So Athlean X is huge into nocebos. He uh, is very reductionist when it comes to injuries or injury risk reduction, although he doesn't actually know what that phrase means because he just says prevents injuries, which is shenanigans. Um, yeah, very, very biomedical model based. His training uh, advice is junk not based in evidence and uh, so yeah for all those reasons and more um, I would not recommend getting information from him and because there are other people with better information out there who are giving it away for free so there you go Hey guys, Austin Baraki here. I'm a starting strength coach, physician, and power lifter. The bar always leaves the floor when balanced directly over the middle of the foot, with the shoulders slightly in front of the bar. Foundation here from the leg, so that when we come down, the first thing is pushing through the leg. Another common error in this step is sitting the hips down too low, usually in an effort to use more quads or to feel like the back is in a better starting position. Okay, the base is going to be through the leg. Get a good strong foundation here from the leg so that when we come down, the first thing is pushing through the leg. So once I have this, my head's up, my back is set. I... However, this will usually kick the bar forward of the midfoot, which takes us back to the problem discussed in step one, where any sufficiently heavy weight will not leave the floor until it comes back over the midfoot. Pull up at the top, to here, push, and then pull. Jeff Spar clearly travels in a non-vertical, inefficient path. This error, as shown by Jeff, doesn't manifest in noticeable inefficiency for very light weights. However, for training weights, this results in hips shooting up, which actually removes the ability of the quads to leg drive the bar off the floor. So to summarize, if your hips rise significantly before the plates leave the floor, you probably set up with your hips too low in the first place. So to summarize, if your hips rise significantly before the plates leave the floor, you probably set up with your hips too low in the first place. So to summarize, if your hips rise significantly before the plates leave the floor, you probably set up with your hips too low in the first place. Remember, the shoulders start out in front of the barbell which means the arms are actually angled very slightly back at the start. This means the bar wants to swing away from you. You must prevent this from happening by using your lats to keep the bar in contact with your legs at all times. Any forward swinging of the bar, easily identified by seeing air between the bar and the legs, automatically means the bar has drifted forward of the midfoot. Observe the vertical bar path and how the bar and his hips rise together. This is efficient form. <laughs> and this is not heavy weight by any means. Poor form for even empty barbells is bound to result in inefficiency for work sets and needlessly compromised training outcomes. 
But I still feel if I was going to grade myself on whether I had command or I didn't, I would give myself a pass here and I would continue. Look at this dude. Leah, do you ever touch program touch and go deadlifts? I don't actually. Never have. Uh, no, I've never programmed them for a client. Why not? I uh, to sum it up, from every client that I can think of that I've worked with, they need quite a bit of work on proper deadlift setup mechanics. I don't want them to be rushing any part of that setup. Yeah, you think they miss a little bit of that yep. if they're if they're actually using mechanical rebound to get through those first few exactly. inches. Exactly. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think you can actually hold your back in the perfect position from a training effect standpoint. I think also. Uh, there's a higher risk uh, injury yes. potential. So we were talking about with like the dodecahedron yeah. plates. The problem isn't pulling with them, right? The fun, that's fine, but when you set them down, the impulse, the bar hitting the ground, it'll jut out in front of you potentially. Almost every time, yeah. And I think that can happen with a touch and go deadlift if the velocity is high enough uh, too. So I, I don't see a point, except for one case where I absolutely would train them as for a CrossFit athlete. Form is everything. So there you have it guys, another perfect workout in the books. As you can see here guys, all sets and all the reps laid out for you as promised. So to be clear, working weight sets of five that we use in training are not five rep maxes. Five rep max being maximal is something that you could do that once and then you'd be spent. You're done. Because your five RM by definition yeah. is that something you could do for five once right. and that's it. You can do three sets of five with it, it's not a five RM. But now if you can do three sets of five with it, it's not a five RM. Right. So at this point in your training, it's probably not useful to do a five RM <laughs> for any particular reason, mm -hmm. unless there's money on the line or a woman. Okay. That's really it. In another video, we talked about recommending 20 rep squat sets to beginners. I just can't fathom where that advice even came from. Let me help you out there. For beginners, establishing a motor pattern is the most important thing. You allude to that point. The best way to establish a motor pattern is through repetition, not through intensity. More reps, higher rep sets, allow for more repetition than low rep sets. We have entirely too many people who are focused on immediately the weight on the bar. Before they've mastered the movement, we've got quarter reppers in all the gyms in all the states and all the land. Do you want quarter reppers? because that's how you get them. Okay, let's take a quick look at the credentials. Hmm, not exactly compelling. Now do it the way I'm showing you here. Breathe out and tighten down. Contract your abs. Make sure that you've expelled the air and that you're tightening up from the inside out. If you're training for strength on the other side of the coin, you might be trying to extend those rest periods. More three to five minutes. If you're training for strength on the other side of the coin, you might be trying to extend those rest periods. More three to five minutes.
neurologically allowing your body to recover and regroup so you can come back and attack maybe that next set to your one to three rep max with a lot more intensity. To your one to three rep max with a lot more intensity. Now do it the way I'm showing you here. Breathe out and tighten down. Contract your abs. Make sure that you've expelled the air and that you're tightening up from the inside out. What's up guys, Brian with NeverState.com and today I want to talk to you about breathing and bracing. You can't just flex your abs, you can't just get a big belly of air, it needs to be the two combined. If you think you have enough air, you don't. Get more. Make sure that you've expelled the air and that you're tightening up from the inside out. Make sure that you've expelled the air and that you're tightening up from the inside out. If you're doing this correctly, the pressure at first until you get used to it is going to make it feel like your eyes are going to explode and your face is just gonna burst. It is what it is. It's the price of lifting heavy things. You should feel much more stable. The squat should feel much lighter. Now, breathing and bracing is essential for a squat and for a deadlift. This is when you breathe in and then you practice what is called the Valsalva maneuver. So this is when you breathe in and then you tighten up your abs. You're not crunching down. You are breathing as much air as possible. And then, like you're about to take a huge dump, you're, or you're about to be punched in the stomach. That's the effect that you want. And this is pretty much unanimous. Almost all strength coaches, real strength coaches, they agree that this is essential for your long-term spinal health, as well as lifting the most weight possible. Except for one person, Jeff Cavalier. Today I'm gonna to show you how to blast through the sticking point on your bench press and how to get stronger there because you are a hell of a lot stronger than you ever thought you were on this exercise. I can guarantee you that. Then for the next five seconds, you're going to now maximally push as hard as you can. You want to try to push this bar through the roof, but it ain't going nowhere. But don't worry, good things are happening. After that, you're going to take a five second rest. This whole 15 second protocol, you repeat 10 times. Now, if you don't have pins, but you're bench pressing at home, you just don't have pins or a rack at home to bench press in, don't worry about it. Just stand up as soon as you're done, head over to the wall, apply the same principles <laughs> no, you would no, in any no, good bench no. press. Elbows tucked, 45 degrees, pushing in, you're not leaning your torso, you're actually pushing with the hands into the wall to so engage your chest. Using a BOSU, I love this for cat search, guys. You don't need to use this, but I really think it's what makes the exercise. I just call these my BOSU squat holds. So, get down, catching stance, here you are here, 90 degrees, I'll turn so you can see, down here, now I'm going for balance, stability, drag it to 60 seconds on this hold. You can simulate, you know, kind of catch and throw, like that, for the front side, catch and throw, a little more rotation so you get a balance out of it. We'll do a kneeling overhead press, okay? Again, let's get a bit of stability going on through our core. It's a good athletic movement. So, barbell here, clean it up. So, barbell here, clean it up. So, barbell here, get down to our lunge. Stabilize and press. Finally, I talked about pushing faster or pushing with more power. Whether you be uh, an MMA grappler or a fighter and you need pushing power or punching power, what you want to do is ditch one of the dumbbells during a, a, a dumbbell bench press and accelerate the one that you do have. Now what you'll do is you'll use your dummy hand or the empty hand to actually drive the acceleration. Trying to do this with one arm tucked to your side, it isn't normal. Then explode, straighten out the arms. That's where the triceps get involved. Slowly return, bring it back. Get some power into it. And that's your cable, rotational, push out. 
Now, I wanna show you something we can do that's explosive, extremely explosive, that takes it to that next level. In slow motion, I'll try to do it because we're gonna actually do a release and catch. As I lift this up, it will be kind of thrown up in the air, grabbed here by the left hand, and then one, two, three for the press, back down here into position to do the next one. So, if I can do this explosively, as I, I probably shouldn't have put the 45 pound on her, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so I get down in here. Up, see, the quick switch into the left hand. One, two, three, into a squat. Here, snatch, up, and then down. Components. Footwork, balance, overhead, you know, ability uh, to lift the move, uh, the dumbbell explosively, powerfully, overhead snatch, Olympic lifting component, overhead snatch, Olympic lifting component, overhead snatch, Olympic lifting component, all that together, and as you can see, a little bit of cardio from that non-stop movement. Guys, this this is what Athlete X is all about. But what we want to do is warm up your body the way it's meant to be warmed up. And like the training, it's athletically, it's athletically, it's athletically. And you start to curl up. Now, these are eight pound weights. Obviously, we're not looking to tire ourselves out. They're going to go straight up overhead. Now, I'm actually kind of shifting side to side. And I have to control that around 10. And you're going to come across your body and come up across and up. Hold it. Okay, now, it's burning by now. Now, we're going to do one right here. Go straight down in front of you and press them up overhead. So, kind of like a clean up. And it's being told how to work with the rest of your upper body. Okay, now, last one. Can it kind of simulate the running Ooh, position right here? <laughs> no, 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 Try to no. Drive them up. One, two, three. Let's hit the hardest for last two. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm advising you to ditch the weight belt. Overuse of this is just going to make inactivity of the transverse abdominis and it results in a weaker transverse abdominus. What you hear all the time is if you wear a belt that's a crutch, you should just strengthen your core. But in general, you don't see that. Most of the data that actually does support that shows uh, uh, what we would call a clinically insignificant difference in muscle activation as uh, uh, based on EMG or other similar analyses. Overuse of this is just going to make inactivity of the transverse abdominus and it results in a weaker transverse abdominus. Overuse of this is just going to make inactivity of the transverse abdominus and it results in a weaker transverse abdominus. So you, so you have it a little bit loose so that now you can push into it and then have that pressure against the pad, which is pushing back in the opposite direction. It's giving you that extra torque in spinal stability. It's giving you that extra torque in spinal stability. It's giving you that extra torque in spinal stability. Now do it the way I'm showing you here. Breathe out and tighten down. 
Contract your abs forcefully. Be conscious of how hard you're contracting your abs. Make sure that you've expelled the air and that you're tightening up from the inside out. You're creating that intra-abdominal pressure. and you set up, you realize that I don't have all that much leverage here when I do with my shallower rib cage and flatter chest to get much force here on the bench press, right? As my arms travel in line with that middle of a uh, uh, deeper chest. From here, again, now, there's a little bit shorter distance, but not much. I can definitely push with a lot more force. Because again, I've involved a lot more of the chest uh, So he's clearly a fan of combining exercises, right? Which has always been one of my biggest pet peeves. You can't ride two horses with one ass, and by trying to combine two exercises into one, you simply miss out on the true benefits of both. But absolutely, if you are training athletes, it is highly useful and beneficial to train to train multiple movements for coordination, etc. It is highly useful and beneficial to train, to train multiple movements, <laughs> Lean forward, pull them up this way. Lean, lean with your hands. So that oh, way? There you go. Hands go up over your shoulder. That way. Almost like you're trying to toss them back over your shoulders. Like that? Yep. Okay. You come down, lean, good. Oh, there you go. The crux of the movement here is the simultaneous extension of the hips and knees, known by Olympic lifters as the second pull, that's used to impart vertical momentum on the barbell and drive it upwards. You shouldn't be using your arms to pull the bar up that last bit. You shouldn't be using your arms to pull the bar up that last bit. I never want you to exhaust yourself in warming up. So to do that, what I recommend is working your way up through some submaximal sets. If you can do half of what your working weight is going to be, then about 20% less than what your working weight is going to be, just do a few reps in, with each weight, enough to, we call it, grease the groove. Fitness expert and father of the kettlebell, Pavel Tetsulin, argues that strength is a skill just like any other. To increase the efficiency of neuromuscular connection, we need to practice strength movements regularly. We have to, as he says, grease the neurological groove. That's why playing the piano is awkward at first, but it gets easier and easier the more you practice. You're increasing neuromuscular efficiencies. Just do a few reps in, with each weight, enough to, we call it, grease the groove. One way to set up your greasing the groove routine is to make it a rule for yourself that every time you pass the pull-up bar in your closet, you're going to do two to three reps, or even one if that's all you can do. That's it. The next time you walk by the pull-up bar, do two more pull-ups or chin-ups. By the end of the day, you may have done 10 to 20 pull-ups. to prepare yourself for the working sets. But what I like to do individually here when it comes to the squat is something we call a touch-up set. And with the touch-up set, we're trying to overreach with about 10% of what we're gonna do in our first working set. y-axis you have your level of fitness or you can think about this as performance on the x-axis you have time just for our reference here let's say this is the end of your eight week program eight week program and so you begin your program over here and it's actually a pretty challenging program and initially you actually lose a little bit of fitness because you're not able to fully recover from the new training. However, as your muscles and tendons and immune system recovers, your fitness level comes back up to baseline. So this section over here where you're actually losing fitness initially, we call that overreaching. To our five rep max. And what we do is we do this in a box squat. 
The box squat is going to allow us to get down there, to feel the safety, to have the confidence that we have a bottom point, to give us that biofeedback to know that that's where I'm heading for. Give it a one or two rep touch, come back up, then start your working sets. What does that do neurologically? That overreach allows us to feel more ready and able to attack our working sets with a lighter weight. To our five rep max. And what we do is we do this in a box squat. The box squats are going to allow us to get down there, to feel the safety, to have the confidence that we have a bottom point, to give us that biofeedback to know that that's where I'm heading for. Give it a one or two rep touch, come back up, then start your working sets. What does that do neurologically? That overreach allows us to feel more ready and able to attack our working sets with a lighter weight. I like to call that, when guys are really arching during the bench press, the bulge press. They think that it makes them push a lot more weight and they're proud of that and they can go around and brag about how much they bench. The problem is guys, all they're doing is artificially creating, first of all, tremendous stress in the lower spine. We're going to put the low back, the lumbar spine, into extension. Most of the arch in the bench press actually comes from lumbar extension and the main result from doing this is decreasing the moment arm between the bar and the shoulder by making the chest higher. The risk, and what you'll hear or read on the internet, is that this can cause a back injury by performing the bench this way. On the one hand, there's minimal compression and vertical loading of the spine when you're lying down, so overextension isn't too big of a problem from a purely mechanical analysis. However, there are people who do not tolerate this extension repeatedly, i.e. with high bench volumes. Even really severe back pain that comes on all of a sudden after a squat or deadlift is probably not an acute disc herniation, but rather a product of too much fatigue and psychosocial factors coming together to produce pain. This doesn't mean that the pain isn't real, it's just that it's probably not from a herniation. In short, there's probably some non-zero risk of back pain with performing an arch, but it's probably not a big deal. Certainly not as big of a deal as it made out to be on the internet anyway. Why don't you try doing the exercise the right way? And that is, guys, as I show you here. Forget about lowering the bar all the way to your chest. I've already talked about, as a physical therapist, the risk-reward to go this extra couple inches. As we take the bar up and then bring it down, okay, I always tell you guys, if you're going to do this, stop here. Okay, the extra inches that you go to go all the way down to your chest, all that does is tilt your, your scapula for, further forward and drive your shoulder more into internal rotation. Scapular retraction, on the other hand, is a bit more nuanced. While lying down on the bench, really try to pull your shoulder blades together. You can see me retracting my scapulae here while standing up, and while I'm lying down, I am really trying to pinch that vinyl or leather between my shoulder blades. The opposite of scapular retraction is scapular protraction. This is a common mistake that people make on the way up. They let their shoulder blades come off the bench press. Really try to keep your shoulder blades pulled back to the bench during the entirety of the rep. Even if you're trying to pinch your shoulder blades together, the weight down here mechanically is going to tilt forward and cause this to go into further internal rotation. The benefits of performing an arch have been covered. We get to shorten the moment arm between the barbell and the shoulder. We also get to reduce the range of motion by expanding the thoracic cavity. And we also put the musculoskeletal system in a greater position to generate force with the shoulder joint being placed firmly against the bench and the muscle of the shoulder girdle being at an optimal length to produce force. This is not to say half reps are inherently dangerous. But instead of contributing to global shit form on bench, he could have given good bench advice. I've touched on the strength speed continuum and the force velocity curve several times on my channel at this point, and especially how covering all the points along that continuum is super important for building overall power. Now, Alec incorrectly says you need to use all of these to develop power. You absolutely do not. Each of these six methods and their derivatives have their place in sports training, but that doesn't mean that they should all be used at the same time by all athletes. So it is a mistake to try to invent the world's best program
by adding a bit of everything that works. So it is a mistake to try to invent the world's best program by adding a bit of everything that works. We will now take a break to observe one of Jeff's other channels. Um, we have Melissa from our Athlean XX for Women channel. Guys, a lot of guys don't even know, realize we have a woman's channel. Cut. And Four, three, two, one. Now pulse. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. You're going to get your balance. You're going to bring your arms up. One arm is going to be pressing out as the other one is punching up. So we're going to be here and we're going to do this motion all at the same time. So I'm really focusing on my triceps with this one arm. My back arm, I'm focusing more on my shoulders. So I really do feel like I get deeper on these uh, in comparison to a back squat. And of course, everything is preference based, should be customized to your body type, your goal. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna balance whether you're on the BOSU or the floor. You're gonna think about dropping and getting the um, dumbbell as close to your foot as possible. So I'm kicking my backside out as I'm kicking this leg out and I'm reaching up. So I'm hitting the base of my glute and my hamstrings, but we're getting a bonus by kind of hitting that, that um, side of the glute too. So we're gonna go all the way down. We wanna make sure that we're tracking, that this knee is tracking over. Actually, I'm sorry, you're gonna hold it here. Our legs are going to be as straight as possible. If you have any lower back pain, you can bend your knees. That'll help alleviate some of the pain on your lower back. Otherwise, you can keep a straighter leg. And you're just going to press it off to one side up towards the ceiling. So we're really working that core, working our shoulders. Super efficient way of hitting arms and core at the same time. Isolate the chest. So I'm gonna go eight to 10. All right, up and squeeze. Stretching down, squeezing up at the top. Pressing motions are great because you're gonna go heavy and you're gonna get strong at them. And adding muscle mass in the pecs, you want to be able to lift a lot of weight. That's hypertrophy, eight to 10. Two more. So as we sit up, we're doing a full curl and we're back to the ground. Sitting all the way up, back to the ground. And down. So you're really getting a nice full curl with this exercise and that's what I like about it. Up and rest. Fourth position, lateral lunge, upright row. You're going to have the slider or towel on one foot. You're going to be holding a kettlebell or dumbbell. You're going to go down into a lateral lunge. You're going to bring your legs back up to start, and then you're just going to raise that kettlebell or dumbbells with your elbows up towards the ceiling. So you're gonna just pop up and land. So with these, I usually do three rounds of anywhere from 15 to 20. All right, so after I finish my three rounds of 15 to 20, so you're just gonna go here and land. Push off and land. Try to get as low as you can on this landing leg. Really great for quads and glutes. Whew. All right, those I'll usually do three rounds of about 15 on each side. So pull in the core, lift the knee up, and back down again. Two, let's go for 10, three, four, five, lift that knee up, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I have a, a dumbbell here. You're gonna come up, squeeze, 
abduction out, come back in, and then down again. So you want to very lightly touch the mat. You don't want to just let everything fall and momentum give you away. So here, push up, open, in, and barely tap. Go again, and then you can start to combine it all together so it's up and out. You're going to think about keeping your hips up high. We're not gonna at any time let that uh, deviate and lower it or raise at all. So you're going to have your dumbbell here and you're just gonna think about raising and lowering. So we're gonna kinda just get this up, lower as far as you can without rotating. And do a, do a weight that's, you know, fairly challenging. This one's a little bit lighter because I just want to kind of demonstrate proper form. Really burns. Whew. Take it out. Four, three, two, one. Go again. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to go three more here. Stay low. You want to be fighting the band the whole time. Your outer glutes should be on fire right here. Four, three, two, one. Come back. And last one right here. Woo! Three, two. So we're gonna raise, rotate, raise. Here. Raise. When I'm rotating, I'm really thinking about nice and tight here, not up to super high here, because this extra weight is going to be a little bit tougher on the lower back. So that's why you start with a little bit lighter weight. Don't go super crazy on this one until you kind of feel how your lower back is with it. Not even sitting all the way up on this one. And you're just gonna to try to push those weights up to the ceiling. So you almost have a little bit of an isometric hold on those abs. And we're coming out for, this is our third exercise. Pulsing out to the side. And you're using those glutes, abductors. I'm performing 20, leaning forward. Nice wide stance. With these, you wanna think about kind of bringing your pelvis in a little bit to protect your lower back. And we're just gonna drop, and you're just gonna do 10 squats. Once you've completed your squats, you're gonna do jumps. You can either continue holding the weight or get rid of the weight. I usually hold on to it because it makes it a little bit tougher. So my pelvis is rotated under, my head and shoulders are staying nice and straight. So we're gonna be here and you're gonna jump and back. As we're lifting our chest. Whew. Sorry, my pants are buckling in the back here. Okay. So just bring your knees to your chest. I'm thinking about squeezing. Let's fall together. Makes it actually engage. The more you squeeze. Five. Four, drive those hips forward. Three, two, last one. Great. And we want to think about our tracking too. And the other thing is you always want to make sure you're hinging at the waist first. You don't just drop straight down. I always tell people you want to hinge a little bit first before you go down into that squat. So you're in a deep squat position and I'm walking forward. I'm just gonna go the length of the step and then I'm walking backwards now. So stepping back, okay, burn that booty out. Here we go, five more forward. Five, four, three, two, one. Reverse it back, whoo. Awesome, forward. We're gonna think about hinging at the waist first, but we're just gonna lower down and back up. We wanna make sure that our foot is tracking too. So we're just getting into as low of a squat as we possibly can, but this is really focusing on that one glute. And up, and back to the top. 
All right, so maybe 10 to 12, 15, depending on how much weight you're using. Those are really good though, I love those. He has a program for women and he says, oh, you need to eat more frequently, otherwise your metabolism will slow down. That's not true. He also says you can eat anything you want. And it has a picture of like chocolate and popcorn and all kinds of food that, you know, are very calorie dense and will make losing weight more difficult. So to me, that's almost like the, excuse me, it's almost like the bait and swap. Yeah, you can eat anything. Will the results be good? Probably not. The level of planning that goes into what we do, the hours and dedication that it takes, I can tell you that that is the only reason why I've gotten as far as I have in my life because um, I was never the most talented, I was never the biggest, certainly not the strongest, but the level of dedication I have, I would put up against anybody, anywhere, in any field of expertise. And that is, I think, why Athlete X excels at what we do. And we're here demonstrating that, I think, again, and um, hopefully you guys are all benefiting from it. You think that body weight training means that you have to go bicep less? Not if you watch what I show you here today. Now, understand, if I don't have a bar and I need resistance, I can use my leg. But from now, from here, my job is to curl the weight up to the shoulder here, you know, up until a peak contraction. I mean, it's actually even better than a bar if you get good at managing your resistance because we have adaptable resistance around the whole way. And then go down. Again, the challenge here is to try to keep the abs out of it as much as you can and let the, butt, the arm and the elbow do the work to pull you all the way up. I'm pulling my body weight in and I'm turning the forearm up at the top. Now, I could already get a good contraction of the bicep here. Looking straight ahead, press the barbell up. The correct lockout position should be directly over the shoulder joint, in line with the back of your neck, not out in front. Looking straight ahead, press the barbell up. The correct lockout position should be directly over the shoulder joint, in line with the back of your neck, not out in front. Pressing the barbell out around your body creates a curved bar path that is not over midfoot. Make sure you finish standing up. Do not lock the weight out with your head back. Standing up with your head under the bar will strengthen and engage your entire shoulder girdle. Standing up with your head under the bar will strengthen and engage your entire shoulder girdle. Here you legitimately have someone needlessly overcomplicating exercise science principles to the point where they're pulling them out their ass and inventing exercises that are patently dangerous and ineffective. But you don't focus on guys like him. No, instead he focuses on the biggest name in the game. And there we have our likely motive. You see, after he made this ill-advised video, his viewership and his subscribers went up 10%. Now for a guy who's been at this for the better part of a decade, that is a lot. And you can guarantee he's gonna continue to shake this sugar tree as long as it's dropping fruit. No, I don't think it's very likely he's gonna make a call out video on a comparative nobody like Joel Seedman. Speaking of comments, I catch a little bit of shit in the comment section for sticking up with Jeff Cavalier. Alec presents me and a couple of other channels as bodyguards for Athlete X, and some of you even suggest that I'm just filleting for views. I have always and I will always stick up for the people that I believe in. If they're putting out good content that helps people, 
I support them. I always tell you guys, if you're gonna do this, stop here. If they're putting out good content that helps people, I support them. So let's go back to this guy. This guy did this in 90 days. He did this in 90 days. He did this in 90 days. If they're putting out good content that helps people, I support them. I mean, it's actually even better than a bar if you get good at managing your resistance because we have adaptable resistance around the whole way. If they're putting out good content that helps people, I support them. If you watch my channel, Alec here should be a familiar face. He recently got a lot of attention after making a video titled, Why Athlean X is Not a Strength Coach. He's recently started a video series on athleticism where he just pokes fun at Athlean X. Well, take a look at this video. All that's really happening here is Jeff is presenting an option to increase the difficulty of a fairly straightforward core exercise. It's simple, it's not really for me, but it's not complicated. Now watch how our boy Harry magically transmogrifies this into something ridiculous. And the scientifically proven irradiation effect that comes about as a result of that glute and core activity causes a super intense biceps contraction that cannot possibly be achieved with normal curl variations. So we're building athleticism and crazy bicep strength and size. <laughs> Let me show you what we got here for you now. We got what I like to call the ultimate abs, oh, the ultimate biceps workout. And I got abs on my mind with zero mole curls. What I'm talking about with the zero mole curl is uh, the, uh, I put it around my body, a band, okay? And I'll tell you, you're going to be able to see muscle growth at a quicker rate. Does something ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. A variation on the first exercise. <coughs> We're gonna take a dumbbell with one hand. Pull, again, one hand in a band up here. Hold one arm down. Again, if I were to let go, I swing back. I'm gonna drop straight down. Up, curl, up. Does something Girl. ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. Does something ridiculous. Functional training. I got a pet peeve about this. Functional training is not balancing on four balls on the ground and you know doing circus acts and trying to look like some something goofy when. That's not what it's about. What it's about is actually doing what we said, purposeful training. This is not lightweight. It's an 85 pound dumbbell. So you don't have to sacrifice your strength to be able to train functionally. I take it up. I bring it up to the top. Now when I come down, this weight wants to come and pull me that way. So my, my core on the left hand side has to stabilize. Okay? So I come down. Anybody that's been following me for any length of time will know how important I believe single leg training is when it comes to getting results. Not just results in terms of leg size and leg strength, but functional leg size and functional leg strength. So we're getting straight down, a little kickstand going on the right side, all the work being done by the left. Straight down, I can maintain good mechanics, okay? Again, I'm not driving the, 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 the car. then explode, straighten out the arms. That's where the triceps get involved. Slowly return, bring it back. Get some power into it. And 
and that's your cable, rotational, push out. Come down here, push up, up in one move, punch. Punch. Explosive. Four punches, come down. 10 pound dumbbells. Come down, uppercut. The, the thing is that overloaded sports movement can actually mess up technique in the actual exercise. Research have shown this, that if speed of movement decreases by more than 10%, you have a negative learning or performance on the actual speed of movement. So basically, if you do too much overloaded work, well, you're gonna learn to become slower. We're seeing guys doing shadow boxing with 10, 15, 20 pound dumbbells. And it's going like super slow movement. It doesn't have any, any positive impact on your capacity to punch. It only makes you slower. We're gonna start down here with what I call tapping kettlebell swings. So I can go a little bit heavier weight here, but I wanna demonstrate that basically we're gonna come up and do a swing but I want to get fast, quick hands, all right? So basically what you're going to do is set yourself up into a swing, get into the routine, get into the pattern, and then the top, tap, tap. At its peak, the kettlebell will reach somewhere around waist or at most chest height. The arms should be treated merely as strings that connect the hips to the kettlebell. They're not involved in pulling it through the legs or artificially pulling it higher than the hip contraction moved it. Would you advise 10 by 10 squats with 70 to 80% one around with one minute of rest for weight loss? No, because you cannot repeat that workout any more than maybe twice or three times a week, probably twice. And thus, when you're trying to lose weight, you should uh, do cardio that is more sustainable, preferably to be done most days. Uh, you know, incline, treadmill, elliptical, jogging, things like that. And people really want to know what is the best form of creatine to take. So I wanted to cover that, especially considering the fact that in our Athlean RX supplement line, we do not use standard creatine monohydrate, and it's for some very good reasons, I think. So I wanted to at least give you guys those, the, the, the clarity on that. So when, when you mix creatine monohydrate, a lot of times it sinks right to the bottom, and it looks like sand on the bottom. That's sort of a microcosm of what actually winds up happening in a lot of people when they take creatine monohydrate. That same sediment winds up making its way into your intestines and trying to be absorbed, you know, calling in more water to try to help with that absorption, which winds up bloating you and giving you that bloated feeling if you've ever experienced that with regular creatine monohydrate. and trying to be absorbed, you know, calling in more water to try to help with that absorption, which winds up bloating you and giving you that bloated feeling if you've ever experienced that with regular creatine monohydrate. With the creatine hydrochloride, because you're doing that and you're increasing the ability to absorb more of it, you're actually able to take a lower dose, so it has a second benefit to you. You don't have to load with 20 grams anymore, and you don't have to maintain dosages of five grams anymore. You could do it with a lot less. About two grams of a creatine, of a creatine hydrochloride is gonna be equivalent to about four grams of creatine monohydrate. That being said, you do increase the risk of GI side effects with loading creatine and for not much benefit, to be honest, and for not much benefit, to be honest. Nobody ever said that these are going to have, give you more power generating benefits than a regular creatine monohydrate. It's going to give you the same benefits of a creatine monohydrate in terms of performance, but with all those added benefits I just told you about, but with all those added benefits I just told you about.
and people really want to know what is the best form of creatine to take. So I wanted to cover that, especially considering the fact that in our Athlean RX supplement line, we do not use standard creatine monohydrate, and it's for some very good reasons, I think. So I wanted to at least give you guys those, the, the, the clarity on that. And then he even thinks it's a good idea to swap out chin-ups for one-arm cable pull-downs. Jeff is not saying these exercises are optimal or better. Today I'm going to show you five very important exercise swaps that you need to start making today. Now a lot of us resort to either the lat pull down or pull ups because they're great back exercises. But there's one thing that's missing from these exercises and we say it all the time here on this channel. If you want to look like an athlete, you've got to train like an athlete. Athletes train with their feet on the ground. These exercises don't provide you that opportunity. When I'm doing the pull up, another great exercise, yes, but I'm floating in the air. Could we train the lats? with our feet on the ground. So we could do it here with a one arm cable pull down. Jeff is not saying these exercises are optimal or better. You see, there's a lot of different ways to do exercises, but the ways I'm gonna show you to change to today might be the most important changes you're gonna make. Work in concert with this one. Okay. If this one's coming back, this one usually comes forward. That's how we walk, right? Yeah. Or run. That's how we walk, right? Yeah. Or run. The fact that his fans just blindly trust him, even when his information is wrong. And I think that's one of the biggest things to take away from this. No one is right all the time. Not him, not me, no one. And you should always question everything you hear. Question what I say. Ask me, say, why is this true? Or ask me to back it up with a scientific paper. Because that's not what people are doing for Jeff Cavalier. They're just believing anything he says because he has almost 10 million followers. Hey guys, Jeff Cavalier from AthleanX.com. And part two this week of Keller Lautner's workout secrets, we're going to head to the bench press and we're going to use the Smith bench because I want to show you a technique that he used to build up his muscle, 30 pounds of muscle is what we've heard you know, in a short period of time. To build up his muscle, 30 pounds of muscle is what we've heard you know, in a short period of time. So I want to put 10%, about 10% more weight on. So in this case, 205 plus another 20 pounds or so, we're looking at about you know, 225. The Smith machine is going to allow me, without a spotter, to do this exercise, and if I fail, I fail. I personally do. I, of course, don't put clips on, and then if I do fail a lift, all I do is I just tilt it to one side, let the clips fall off, and then as a reaction, of course, the other side will tilt over. So anyway, once the bar contacts your stomach, you need to continue to support the weight with your arms. You can let some of the load rest on your belly, but you If I have a spotter with me, then you don't need to do a Smith machine. But I like this because you can do it for that reason. So I come here, I come here, rep out, rep out, another rep out, I'm down, I'm down, I might be able to get it up. And then let's say if I fail, I fail, but if I can come down one last negative, Especially if you're in the Smith machine, and that's it. Hey Jordan, opinions on Athlean X. I do not think that he mixes science with anything. Pseudoscience. Bullshittery. He may be gone, but his teachings live on through us, his students. Wherever we may go, we must carry on his vision. 
functional component. And I do kind of hate that word because functional training kind of went in and out as a phase. And when it came in, it had its, it, the merits of core strength and being able to have balance and coordination. And, but then it kind of took a little bit like of an extra leap in that phase where it became maybe some nonsense stuff. Some nonsense stuff. We have to be more than just strong. We have to be functionally strong. Get on that one leg. Take your hands together. Some nonsense keep stuff. Keep them up. Press it up over your head. You can see that every time I press up. Some nonsense stuff. Some nonsense stuff. Some nonsense stuff. How's it feel? Glorious. Some nonsense stuff. 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 Some nonsense stuff.